Good evening, fellow alumni. Welcome to the AIM Alumni Association of India and FAME webinar. As you know, our webinar series started in April 2020 with discussing how various industries have been affected by the pandemic. We had alumni and our esteemed professors explaining the same in detail from their perspectives. Then in the next leg, we entrepreneur series wherein we had fellow AIM entrepreneurs from business, social, and developmental fields. We also featured an exclusive all-lady webinar having speakers from Southeast Asia. Your association has always been looking for newer formats, so I keep the webinars engaging and interesting to its target audience, which is you. Today's webinar is one such effort in that direction. We have amidst us our esteemed alumnus and AAA awardee, Mr. Yashowardhan Azad, in conversation with our passionate and energetic alumnus and my co-exec com member, Asavri Desai Sarvi. Today's topic is going to be exhilarating and interesting to say the least, as we have seen from the Yasho talk on Prime TV channels and his Twitter and the article he has published. I'm sure we also have a lot of topical questions to ask dear Yesho. Please feel free to type it in the chat box. As we are all AIM students and good at CP, brevity is requested. Now over to Asavri. Thanks Nikhil for the wonderful introduction. Without much further ado, I would like to delve into questions which will cover three broad categories. The first one about your background and your education. The second part will talk about your professional journey. And the third part will seek your esteemed opinion on some of the contemporary issues facing India. So let's uh, start with your family. You obviously come from a very successful family. Please tell us about your parents and your siblings and how they have influenced you as a person and your career choices like getting into public services. Thank you very much for inviting me to this platform. In fact, I'm a little embarrassed uh, and uh, uh, facing a little bit of trepidation in answering your questions because I never thought I don't belong to the corporate world. I belong to the, to the government, uh, but of course with equal exposure on both sides. But let me say that it's a privilege uh, to be here and um, answering your questions. Uh, first, uh, my dad was a, uh, you know, a freedom fighter uh, from a village school, did very well, you know, did well on scholarships, got involved with the freedom movement and got elected to the first parliament of Lok Sabha in 1952, as perhaps one of the youngest members at the age of 29 and 30. I think it was his passion for, you know, politics, uh, uh, Hindi literature, uh, sports that had a very, very deep impact on me. And throughout my life, because uh, he was in uh, various uh, avatars, he was a cabinet minister in, in the government of India. Later on, he became chief minister of Bihar. Uh, but he still kept on writing uh, things on literature in Dharmayog. He wrote a book, Meri Bhav Yatra. So his, uh, his impact was very deep. And on the other hand, my mom, I think she was matriculate fail. Um, uh, but what she made up was with complete indulgence, her love was unconditional. And I still believe today, if there is one love in this world, it's of a mother for the child. I don't know whether it can be vice versa or not. Uh, my uh, siblings, my elder brother, Dr. Rajvardhan Azad, the real professional amongst three of us, was uh, in Medi All India Medical Institute, very bright. He headed the I Institute of the All India Medical Institute. He was overlooked for the directorship of AIMS. So he went to Patna, opened a hospital. He's uh, listed on the American Academy of Medical Sciences. He's also uh, the chairman of the University Selection Commission in Bihar, which is a very, very valued post. Uh, plus he has made a mark in retina. Uh, retina surgery, including cryosurgery all over the world. And my younger brother, Kirti Azad, um, people might be knowing him. He was a member of the World Cup, uh, a big cricketer. I regret because of him, I had to leave cricket because he was six years younger, but he was so good that I had to say <laughs> goodbye. 
And uh, later on, of course, he joined politics. He became member of parliament and he represented Darbhanga. Uh, so uh, I had a pretty, you know, rocking family. We, we had good times uh, together. And, uh, but my dad was a very strict disciplinarian. And I think it, because of him, somehow in my mind, you know, public service got steeped in that, yes, this is the line I must uh, pursue. And I did later. Great. Thanks for that. So you've always been multifaceted. You've participated in extracurricular activities, dramatics, debates, and you've excelled in sports. Like you said, you've also played football, cricket, you've helped your teams win. So how instrumental have these extracurricular skill sets been in shaping your personality and your career? You know, let me say at the very outset, and um, some people may not like it, but you know, they say about Indians that uh, they are outstanding in merit. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But where they lack uh, is the real skill, the ground skills. And um, some people even tell me that uh, while they are recruiting, uh, while they find them complete in all qualifications, it, they still need to go through the training of three to four months for, for the exact skills which are required for something. Basically, it's a kind of a personality development. And I think schools today in the country have lost that. During our period, you know, I was in St. Xavier's uh, Patna, uh, one of the renowned schools uh, of the country, the Jesuit school, uh, uh, really, where uh, the accent was on developing all skills. You know, you were supposed to you know, um, make a good cover drive. You're also supposed to be good in declamation. You're supposed to uh, be a member of the yearbook. And, and you had to have wide range of interests. So as a result, I, I uh, there, was a, there was a shortcoming also that I wasn't, I didn't become brilliant in any one particular thing because, you know, I neither went to the medical school or to the engineering school, which the bright guys went. I was a jack of all trades and master of none. Did reasonably well in school, got a first division uh, above average. Made it to one of the colleges in uh, in in, in um, you know uh, Delhi University, and finally did my MA in Delhi School of Economics. But throughout, I kept my debating alive because, as I told you, uh, I had to leave my cricket because of my brother. I was always under his shadow, though he was six years younger than me. And I remember one of the matches we were playing in Delhi, Ferocia Kotla ground where Madan Lal, the fast bowler, was uh, bowling from Madan Meekins. And we got out on 13 or 14, and here was this kiddo uh, in seventh class. He hit a brilliant 91. So that's the day I told my cricket coach, I said, thank you very much. I've had a good time with you guys. <laughs> and I started concentrating on my studies and debates. And so that's how I landed up in, in the Delhi School of Economics. And I loved extracurriculars throughout. It has given me an attitude to life that, uh, you know, there are two ways of living. And I always say during my lectures, one is that you are positive about everything in life. Everything, every time you get in the morning, the fresh Lipton tea, or you look at the sky, you hear the bird chirping, you hear your music, and you have a very positive attitude. The other is that you complain about everything. You know, today my left side is paining, that fellow, you know, he's bored me to tears. So one half of life you keep criticizing and the other half you realize the futility of it. So I think extracurriculars have played a great role in my life. And I always feel that people who have been sportsmen and have the sportsman spirit always stand out different from the others. Great, thanks. So do you have a role model or a mentor? If yes, who and what aspects of that person inspired you? You know, I, I can't say whether I have a role model or not, but two incidents in my life, I, I recall, I really played a very major role in my life. I remember doing pretty well in, in my uh, class one. Everyone does well. So um, a little double promotion here, there, class one here or something. And so my dad was very happy. He says, what do you want? This is 1961 and uh, senior um, uh, class one. And I said, I want to see Chacha Nehru. You know, those days we were devoid of Twitter, uh, you know, TV even, uh, no social media, nothing. You had a Philips radio where I used to hear a commentary about Puller and uh, Richardson um, uh, from England, Stackpole, Keith Stackpole and those ones, that was on the radio and a newspaper, that's about all. And the real hero of the children those days uh, would be some Bollywood stars, but it was Chacha Nehru who had 
actually, you know, captured the imagination of kids. And so my dad said, yes. And uh, he took me to the parliament and there in the central hall, uh, I was waiting. He says, you have to stand here. So I stood on the table. Uh, there were two, three MPs, his friends sort of guarding me, holding me. And there from a distance, I saw him coming. He says, now he's coming. You better behave yourself. Keep quiet. He might ask you a few questions also. So there was Chacha Nehru. He came. He slapped me hard on my cheeks and says, uh, I heard that you wanted to meet me. I said, yes. I said, why? I said, I've done very well in my class and all that. So he looked at me. He says, what did you say your name again? I said my name. He slapped me very hard. He said, you like ice cream? I said, yes. So he asked one of the MPs standing by, okay, you get him Kevinter ice cream. Those days, Kevinter ice cream was very famous. So that was the time I met him for about five seconds. And then I used to tell everyone that Chacha Nehru knows me and I have sort of met him and we are at very, very good terms with each other. Second was, <laughs> we used to live in 10 South Avenue near Ashpati Bhavan and I used to go to Mount Carmel. So there was no security at that time. So I was walked through the gates that, that tall uh, security guard, I used to salute him and he used to salute me back and I used to feel very good about it. One day I asked my dad, who lives in this big, uh, big place? I was in uh, nursery or KG. He says, is the Rashpati of India. Uh, and his name is Dr. Rajinder Prashad. He's from Bihar. Would you like to meet him? I said, yes, I would certainly like to see him. So he crossed over one day went to see him. And uh, Dr. Rajinder Babu, I still remember. This was 1960, I think, if I remember. He was there till 62, yes. And I went there. He was sitting with a few people in his khadar clothes. And then he gave me Bedna Dham Ka Peda. Peda is famous from our place. Uh, it's called Devkar. And these two incidents really played, you know, havoc in my mind. These big guys. And then my dad used to tell the story about these guys, how they fought with the freedom movement. He told me about the British history. He told me about the revolutionary movements. My three heroes became, you know, Shivaji, uh, Pratap, uh, Bhagat Singh, and of course, Chanshegar Azad, Ashfaqullah Khan, and these guys who laid down their lives. And then I had the fortune of meeting some brilliant people like Vijay Lakshmi Pandit. Vijay Lakshmi Pandit was a great ebullient, you know, a Democrat, a socialist, a, a diplomat. It was wonderful talking to her. Uh, I met uh, Agye, that great poet who, who presented me his book, Sunare Shaiwal. On one side were the photographs and other sides were his poems. One of the beautiful poems I still remember. What a beautiful description of an evening. And then there were, you know, a lot of literatures who would be there in the evening. Rajendra Yadav, Munu Bhandari, uh, the editor of Dharmayog, Surendra Jha, editor Times Today, my uncle. Meeting a lot of people like Chan Shekhar, Jagjeevan Ramji, Bureaucrats, Karyappa, the general Karyappa. Mm. You know, this makes a deep impression on the mind of, of a child. I think that is one of the reasons why also I was so motivated towards working for uh, the civil service. Good, thanks. <laughs> so you studied economics and then you did your IPS and you were doing well professionally. So then why did you choose to do your master's in management? And this question is specifically for Nikhil, why AIM? <laughs> Well, let me tell you, I got into the civil services in 1976 and my cadre was Madhya Pradesh. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when I went and I was training there, it was a hard training. I mean, uh, the, the, the training is pretty hard. It's two years. And later on, when you go to the districts, you know, you, I'm going from Delhi, a metro to the back of the beyond, an absolutely rural area. And that is where you get to know the real India. And at the age of 26, it was pretty young. Uh, by any standards, I was the superintendent of police of a huge district with a population of about, you know, 0.8 million, eight, eight, eight to nine lakhs people. And I must say it was a hard grind. Uh, those days we didn't have, uh, you know, uh, the, these air conditioners, we didn't have these swanky cars, you know, even for a superintendent of police, you had a huge British type bungalow, you had all the facilities, but what would you do except working for about 12 to 14 hours a day, there was no socialization. There was nothing, there was just nothing. And I think uh, uh, 
uh, I was there for about two and a half to quarter to three years. And I felt, you know, jaded, worn out, exhausted. And I also felt that I had maybe I'd lost all my brains too, because, you know, I was, I was just, you know, pummeling in the countryside cases. So there was this opportunity, somebody told me, and from, my friend from Bombay, Sudhir Karni, uh, who was working in Siemens, uh, he said, hey, this AIM thing, why don't you uh, give the exam? <laughs> so I gave the exam. Now, why AIM is because I couldn't have got into, uh, you know, United States, I never had the money for it. <laughs> But for the AIM, the advantage what it was called the poor man's Harvard at that time. I remember poor man's Harvard. And I was getting a very good salary and I got study leave. I, I requested the chief minister. So study leave means that I'll get my full salary, full emoluments and everything, which was very comfortable for me because when I asked that, he flatly refused. He said, I'm not here to you know, finance you or subsidize you. <laughs> he was one of those strict disciplinarians. So that's why I chose the AIM and I did never regretted it. That was one of the best, best innings of, of, my, uh, of my life. Great. So now coming to your professional life, you've held some very important positions in the government of India, including police services, intelligence, information, sports, environment. Which role did you enjoy the most and why? Well, Savri, if you're asking me which one I enjoyed the most, then I'll say director youth, director youth and sports. And I'll tell you why, <laughs> how I joined. I was, I was like a police commissioner of, of uh, the capital of Madhya Pradesh. I was DIG range, um, uh, you know, uh, Bhopal. And I got into a very big row with the home minister. <laughs> and there was some uh, exchange of ideas, should I say, or, or some words. And I think that day itself, he sat down and, and made sure that I was kicked out oh, uh, yeah. of, uh, yeah. So uh, good for me. I think they were looking for the worst place for me where to post because normally this is what happens. And, but I had a home secretary, Vijay Singh, who, who really was very, very fond of me. And at that time, I was going to Atlanta for that uh, as a member of the International Security Advisory Team. Uh, that was another memorable, memorable experience for me. So, uh, I, 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 and I was going to be away for 40 days. So they, they held on and then they announced later. And I remember uh, Mr. Vijay Singh ringing me up. He says, we finally found you the worst place. And uh, that is called Director Youth and Sports where nobody goes, <laughs> no IS or IPS has been posted there before. So uh, that's the place. I said, sir, thank you very much. I, I, I love sports. And you give me a license to kill because as director youth, I can keep on going to various colleges and uh, exhorting the youth to follow the ideals of Mahatma Gandhi. <laughs> he said, shut up and get back to work. <laughs> so I think I enjoyed that because, you know, uh, it, was, it was so exciting being in, in, in the centers like Gwalia, uh, where there was a culture of sports, where there was stadium earlier. We are trying to get tartan tracks. We are trying to get uh, the, the hockey stadium. We were trying to prepare for the national games. I got in touch with um, uh, Suresh Kalmadi. I got into touch with uh, with uh, Raja Randhir Singh, and and you know because of my association with them, I learned such a lot that I was able to bring a lot of things to Madhya Pradesh by way of infrastructure. Not very much, but at least one was able to you know unite uh, the sportsmen. Then that stadium in Bhopal we had, it came alive. I think it was one of the most exciting phases of my life of one or two years. And I enjoyed that to the hint. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So as Central Information Commissioner in five years, you gave judgment in over 8,000 cases covering various sectors like healthcare, environment, public services, medical admissions, and facets of administration and governance. Many of these cases have been widely acclaimed and published. This is an incredible achievement. Can you please explain what is the role of the Central Information Commissioner and elaborate on some of these key cases and implication of some of these pertinent judgments passed by you? Uh, let me say that uh, the right to information uh, is, is, uh, is called the sunshine legislation. And when it came about in 2004, there were tremendous expectations from the government because the preamble of the right to information says 
uh, lays stress on transparency and accountability. It, it calls for the governments to be more and more accountable, the governments to be more and more transparent, and it was a part of a UN policy declaration uh, uh, um, much, much earlier in 48, and later on, the countries started, uh, you know, adopting this legislation. It was a very, very proud moment for me, let me tell you, when I visited Manila and uh, I, was, uh, I was briefing the senators and therefore the AIM, it was at the AIM and Jumbo would be very happy to hear this. It was at the Asian Institute of Management that I gave this uh, speech uh, to the lawmakers and to the various civil society and policy makers over there on the right to uh, information, the way it has been enacted in India and Philippines was thinking of enacting at that, uh, at that time. And I went to the university also there, what uh, Ant Antony or whatever that university is. I went and addressed those students and professors also over there. Now, right to information, basically it means that a common man is able to ask any questions with the government departments. And it is incumbent upon the incumbent departments to give all the information to him unless they are barred by a few provisions like say you know the sovereignty issue or you have some uh, uh, some uh, private issue these are things which or the matter is in the court etc cetera, etc cetera. the idea is that a common man is empowered with the information he gets now there was a, there has been a culture of you know a kind of a secrecy you know the government babus would like to keep everything under there because that is where the power lies. Information is power. And hence, as an information commissioner, you are like a Supreme Court judge. That's the status you're given in terms of emoluments and all that. You are supposed to sit on appeals. If a person has been denied information by a government department, then he comes to you in second appeal and then you're supposed to educate and give, direct the government de departments to give him information. Now, what happens is due to this, there are many things which come out. There are skeletons which come tumbling out the cupboards. cupboards. For example, one of the most important decisions I still remember, it was about the disappearing water bodies in Delhi. Where are these water bodies which were there in Delhi? There were 900 of them. So what happened to them? Then the first reply comes, no, no, this was with DDA, this was with the Delhi government, this was with that government. So where do you get a consolidated report? What are the efforts being done to revive the water bodies? And after pushing it further and further and further, till I get a reply from the secretary, yes, sir, these are the number of water bodies, and this is exactly what is being done. A high court has already given a direction in this direction. And now in pursuance of the high court directives, we are doing this, this, this. This is one. Second, I remember was one of the most important was on the birth certificates. Um, uh, uh, th there is a racket uh, in the birth certificates which was being given by the municipalities. For example, reducing the age, you know, if your age is 21 and you, you like to make it 17, you know, these are old, old age practices <laughs> which you do. In cricket, I have seen that if you're playing under 16, there are guys who are 18 years old, they'll get some certificate at 16 and, and, and then play. This is, these are all things. So, you know, basically these are all kinds of things which need to be trashed, which need to be cleaned up. Uh, there, are, there were things about ration cards, there were things about widow pensions, and there were, there, were, there were issues on admissions, medical admissions, doctors. I was so happy when a girl from Karnataka, she had appeared for the exam and in, in the merit she was higher, but because she was not getting an admission uh, because of some problem which was created at the university. When I asked for the record, it was clear that it was her merit uh, which had to be recognized and finally she got the admission. So this was very satisfying. You know, Central Information Commissioner post was also very satisfying to me because for the first time in my life, I didn't have a boss. Uh, uh, so I was giving leave to myself. <laughs> I, was, I was doing everything to myself. But in the process, since I was reporting to my conscience, I was working slightly harder also. So I enjoyed that. Video. Great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. You have worked successfully under different political administrations. What are some learnings on how to perform effectively 
uh, were there instances when you were looked as being loyal to your to the opposition how did you deal with it yeah. now that's a very sensitive question you asked me let me let me attempt to answer uh, in the best possible manner uh, you know uh, there is a tendency in the government and i think maybe all over the world that the key positions they like to fill in with their own people you know own in apostrophe own means now we have a civil services here and and malini will agree with me uh, that the key positions you know the chief secretary secretary the chief minister intelligence chief you know director general of police they would like to uh, post people they like of course seniority and merit should be the you you, you, you cannot uh, override seniority completely but in my case i was superseded so i know it can be overridden too uh, but uh, uh, there is a sad part in the sense that uh, the governments today there's a, there's an increasing tendency of seeing somebody as mine or theirs and if you see in up bihar all the other states this has been happening to quite an extent you will also see that in governments from a particular state there'll be a lot of uh, a lot of bureaucrats in my case i can always i can only say that uh, since i was uh, uh, i was in a district for five and a half months and in mansoor i remember where we were able to make a haul of eight quintals of opium uh, and uh, also during the um, you know the anti sikh uh, riots which took place in 84 not a single sikh was hurt in our area and we also passed 350 trucks of sikh to safely uh from indore to to jaipur but uh, i got the order for transfer in five and a half months because i think that you know, all the political parties got together and i was kicked out so i in fact i told the chief minister i said thank you sir for kicking me upstairs because he was sending me to a bigger place mm -hmm. so my experience has been that you know i've been moving out like this uh, even in one regime uh, but it is a reality uh that uh, people there is a more and more tendency of getting your own guys there are two instances of course in my life uh, where uh, i was affected by this in a different way when i was uh, superseded for the post of the chief of the intelligence bureau uh, because my brother kirti azad happened to be uh, a member of parliament of the opposition so you know how can you help <laughs> 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 and of course there were other reasons to however and secondly when i was a uh, central information commissioner and my turn came to become the chief uh, again it came on the other side this was another party this was the B bjp that was congress this was bjp when uh, my uh, brother was running a campaign against uh, arun jetli because of corruption in delhi district cricket association so i was superseded as the chief of uh, uh you know chief central commissioner also uh, but that's all right i mean I, i've taken it as a stride these are uh, these this is collateral damage you have to accept uh, one way or the other and uh, this is something which you have to face in the service but one thing is there that your reputation in the service is known in the first 5 years itself and uh, so accordingly you get posted or denied or coveted and you should be prepared for it okay thanks So, how do you prepare mentally when you are on a key security assignment, especially where stakes are very high, like that for the prime minister? Well, let me say that uh, first time I crossed into Pakistan via the Wagha border uh, 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 with uh, the present uh, chief of RAW, Amanta Goel, and uh, I was uh, in charge of the VIP security division, and. Um, this was for a sark conference where atal bihari which i watch page uh, was going to pakistan and there in uh, pakistan you know in india is different but if you are in pakistan and you are advising them security because security is their matter and i remember um, uh, mr menon was there uh, as the uh, our, our um, you know high commissioner uh, who became nsa later and uh, also uh, Rajesh Chandra, he was also there, the secretary to the uh, to the Rajesh Mishra, secretary to the Prime Minister, 
And uh, well, it was uh, on key issues when you realize at one end, you realize you're very helpless because you're really advising them. The responsibility is theirs. Uh, so it's, uh, your heart is jumping and, and, and you wait uh, for the inevitable, for the time when it passes by and then you just thank God. Um, you know, and there's one thing in security, no matter how much you work, we say that, you know, physical, uh, 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 physical uh, examination and everything, it gives you 50% success. Uh, techn technology, use of technology gives you 75%. Using a dog, et cetera, et cetera, gives you about 95 and the last 5% is, of course, left to God because yes. nobody else can, uh, can do anything about it. I recall that, uh, you know, I was secretary security when I was kicked upstairs again when I was uh, Miss the IB chief. So my role was not direct in protection of the prime minister because there is a director SPG, special protection group, who looks after. But as secretary, of course, you, you, you have the uh, wider responsibility. And that is why... We were just uh, trying to follow the rules and rest. We were just, you know, keeping our fingers crossed. Uh, there were also um, visits of very high profile visits like Putin and uh, Pope. Um, um, Pope gave a very nice medallion uh, to us in, in commemoration of that visit. Uh, and also Clinton, I think. And Clinton was very kind. I mean, in fact, uh, his, uh, his, his team asked me if he would like to meet uh, the five uh, security commanders and I invited four of my colleagues, Delhi Commissioner and others. And Clinton was very nice. He almost spent over uh, 35 seconds with us. So, and uh, we had a cup of tea and that was very nice. So there are some rewards too and I still have his photograph here, <laughs> shaking hands with him. So what, according to you, are the top three or five fundamental changes that India needs to make to become a front runner in the world? Wow. You know, uh, uh, I think there are two key things uh, which uh, India really needs to, to, to look at. One is education and the other is health. And uh, enhancing the, the, you know, the budget allocation for this has been a, you know, demand for long. Unless you increase the budget for these two, I think we won't be able to uh, be called a world power uh, unless we invest adequately in education health. Secondly, I feel our healthcare systems and the educational system need a very, very, you know, overall revamp. You know, we, we don't need a Central Vista revamp, but we certainly need a healthcare revamp. And there is a lot of problem with the medical education. There is a lot of problem because I was dealing cases with the MCI. And, uh, you know, somehow we have not been able to get right. We have not been able to get going our primary health centers. You know, most 80% of our cases need not come to, to Delhi or, or other places. We have overloaded the system. You know, in Delhi alone, we need about 10 All India Medical Institute of Sciences. There are All India Medical Institute of Sciences which have been opened in the various states, but they're not functioning well. I know about Bhopal, that's my Carter. I know also about uh, uh, the one in Odisha. I know also about the one which is now coming up uh, in, in um, Devghar, which has been announced, and, and in Patna. They're not functioning well. And they need, they need a kind of, a, it's one of the most fundamental changes, if I would say, is the healthcare system. Second, about the education system. You know, 70% of the um, education people are getting is of no use. You know, learning a history, learning a geography here and there, learning that. And besides, we have such, you know, amazing international, you know, language debates that, you know, that lead us nowhere. Education has to be with a purpose, you know, cramming academic degrees is, is hardly, I think 80% of the jobs uh, India, you can get after school. You don't need to go through college and college and other places should only be for higher education and people who are fit for that. 
I think the third thing which we need very critically is again the infrastructure part. I mean, something like Golden Quadrilateral, which, which you know, Atal Bihari Vajpayee did, was an excellent thing. Even, even Gadkari is, is, is doing a great job in, in you know, making those highways. We need to connect India. We need to reconnect India. And this, you know, cutting down on various frivolous things, we need to concentrate on in, um, in infrastructure. The fourth thing which comes to my mind is, I think we need a different kind of a metro management. You know, metro cities today need a different kind of governance. You have a government in Delhi which doesn't have any powers. It doesn't have MCD, it doesn't have DDA. There is a plethora of institutions which are running metro. Garbage cleaning is somebody else's hand. Mechanical sweepers for the dust bowls creation, it's in some other hand. If we are talking about pollution, anti-pollution measures, you know, the BJP is blaming AAP, the AAP is blaming Congress, center is blaming Haryana, it's useless. If you have a chief minister, you have to give him powers of transfer of IAS and IPS officers, you have to give him a, a control over land and the police, or you remove it and have a mayor. Secondly, the metro, the, the property taxes, you know, the whole thing is in a mess. Today, if India is trying to become a superpower in the world and you want foreigners to come and stay, you know, your traffic should be a little better. Your pollution should be a little better. Your space management should be better. You should have better uh, public spaces. You should have better public transport. All this needs a relook. It has to be looked into. And the fifth thing which I feel is that Indians need a lot of self-discipline. You know, in the name of democracy, we seem to be getting away with anything. You know, talking anything, behaving in a we don't believe in cues, we don't believe in any kind of delays, we love jumping on each other, we love prying on others' lives, we, we, we don't want to respect privacy. There is nothing which... So unless you have a kind of a self-discipline, you see Swachhata Abhiyan, how can Swachhata Abhiyan be successful if you don't discipline yourself and Swach yourself? So these are five issues I think India needs very, very badly and not very difficult also. So now coming on to the, how can the Indian criminal justice system which covers the judiciary, police and civil services be overhauled and streamlined to make them more effective? My goodness, that, that this is something which is the need of the hour, need of the decade or the need for last so many years. And let me tell you that so many attempts have been made to reform the criminal justice system. Uh, uh, you know, the police today, the, the, the funny part is even the police wants to reform itself, but the state governments are not allowing it to be reformed. The Supreme Court gave a, a, a directive uh, to the various state governments in uh, 2004, I think, yeah, 2004, 2006, uh, 2006, I think. And uh, the state governments are not following. They made sham of a police uh, act. Uh, which is going in the name of um, uh, compliance of Supreme Court directives. In fact, when the Chief Justice Thomas himself was aghast when it was, he was reviewing the implementation that this is not what we had expected. Uh, the prosecution needs to be changed completely, overhauled, because prosecution is pathetic. Um, they are, they are ill-paid, they are uh, very poorly organized, uh, their quality is, is very poor, and that's why most of our cases are, are falling apart because for all important cases, you have excellent lawyers uh, from the other side. In the courts, we have unnecessary delays. Supreme Court has tried its best. Uh, there was a Malimat committee report to improve upon the criminal justice system, but many of the things we have not been able to do. But criminal justice system requires a tremendous political will on the part of the government also of the judiciary uh, to, to reduce cases. And also it is incumbent on the lawyers to play a, a positive role because most of the lawyers are just getting away with murder by just you know postponing the trials on and on and on. You see the three cases, uh, for example, uh, which, which happened, uh, Hathras incident, which is a very famous incident. Uh, 
there is another incident uh, which was down south where you know the police brutality led to the real murder of those people in the year. now these are things which need to be set right by the police leadership by the by the judiciary because there are so many things in the police that the police leaders can do you you can't allow at the lower level the kind of insensitivity uh, which 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 we are uh, which we are seeing right now but it needs a collaborative effort because you know at the lowest level in india and it may be in other places too there is uh, the, 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 it's 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 so impacted hard by the social fault lines and the, the the political vortex that it's very difficult to get out of that trap mm -hmm. and that is why all the institutions are affected it it came about uh, with with in, in stark reality in vikas dubey's case in up as also in 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 um, in hatras case mm -hmm. and that is why you know chief ministers with a vision I uh, tried earlier there have been many chief ministers i must say some politicians have been outstanding but the entire system is 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 kind of not responding to it and that's why it needs a collab collaborative effort not only in the part of bureaucrats and the policemen but also the political parties and the opposition to bring about and you know in in england i was reading a book uh, by the uh, police commissioner of london Uh, where the meet it was such a refreshing meeting they had where the minister called the meeting representatives of the court were there prosecution were there police were there municipality were there and all of them were there and this is the kind of uh, uh, response or this is the kind of meetings we need in india uh, so that we are able to bring about some difference in our criminal justice system okay great So now, talking about contemporary things, what is your view on criminal investigations done these days through media trial, which lead to influencing and swinging public opinion to a conclusion in one direction without any balanced assessment? My goodness, I mean, this is something which all of you have been uh, watching. In fact, I read uh, a tweet today that 69 to 70 percent of the time of the discussions on two channels took place on Sushant Rajput's case. and uh, so many uh, i mean uh, incidents were narrated throwing so much of information that it would almost almost trap an investigator into following a particular line of investigation it's unfortunate it's really unfortunate you know earlier on uh, uh, it was it was uh, a rule imposed upon us that you will not talk uh, about uh, investigation outside you know whatever is is uh, needed to be told to the press you can say yes we are taking up investigation uh, this is our investigator will you know file the charge sheet in so many days but nothing beyond that but today you know the demands of the uh, democracy demands of the various channel have become so you know they're, they're so insisting uh, that uh, many a times you come up inadvertently Uh, with information which which should not have been there in the public domain it's unfortunate i mean uh, uh, after all the broadcasters uh, have to they don't want to be regulated by the government so at least there should be self regulation but unfortunately we have not been able to uh, see that also and in fact this is one of the issues i used to discuss a lot with the ex information and broadcasting minister manish tiwari who is a member of parliament town and as you think of and he agreed with me he says you know self regulation is failing so what do we do do we should the government impose something which is again not possible so we only hope that uh, they will become a little they'll impose some self restraint on them and discuss among themselves their boundaries uh, under which they should uh, act or perform okay thank you So, what, according to you, is the impact on India and the best strategy for India, given the current geopolitical dynamics like the Galwan situation, China's new coalition with Nepal, Pakistan, and reportedly with Iran, and the changing Middle East dynamics? Well, let me say at the very outset that uh, it's a refreshing change in our um, Indian policy um, towards China. For long, we have been very subdued about Tibet. uh not to hurt the sentiments of the chinese 
Uh, we have uh, been muted about our uh, support to Taiwan. Uh, we have not um, uh, raised very loudly the issue of Xi Jinping, that Uyghur, the treatment of Uyghurs over there. Uh, and also their, their complete clampdown in, in Hong Kong for that matter. Uh, now, Chinese have always, always betrayed us. I mean, you know, and unfortunately there was a group of China experts here who always used to, you know, uh, uh, advise that, you know, we should be a little, we should, be, uh, uh, restraint was always advised in terms of border talks with China. Nothing happened with, with respect to the border talks. Uh, the, the experts became experts writing policy papers and nothing happened. Exactly the same thing happened. Salami slicing, they did it in Arunachal. For long, they have clearly disputed Ladakh and, and Arunachal. And again, today for the first time, I must say, that we have a bargaining chip with, with the Chinese because we control the south of, of Pangong. And, and for the first time, they also raised, when they raised the issue to vacate the Chushul Heights, we said we should get back to the situation of April when you get out of that fourth, from the fourth finger mm. that is on the Pangong. So I would say that uh, uh, India needs to do a lot now is it, it must join the Quad in a big way. It is already the meeting was held on 6th October. There are, there are the, the, the members of the uh, Southeast Asia um, uh, who, uh, who will be very much interested in this. Asia needs to be multipolar. It cannot be uh, the Chinese sway as they want to be the only uh, a leader in, in Asia. And uh, as far as the relations with uh, Pakistan, that's true. But Pakistan is itself going in a turmoil. Uh, in fact, the POK uh, uh, it can even become COK. The Chinese occupied Kashmir the way it's going on. But there are many who don't want uh, the Chinese, uh, the route going through Balochistan to that Gwadar, uh, uh, where, they are, where they have uh, made a huge, huge uh, establishment. Uh, I would also say that even with respect to Nepal, good things are happening. Our, our general is going there. He's going to be again made the honorary general as per traditions. Nepal has also opened up uh, 30 outposts now for, for on, on, on the Chinese border. And uh, like Maldives uh, is again rethinking on their collaboration with the Chinese. So things are changing and India should accordingly, uh, you know, it, we no longer have the Indo-Soviet Treaty. Uh, we don't belong to any particular year. India it itself is an emerging power. And so it should be, uh, it should not hold any, no holds barred in, in trying to bring China on the mat the way they have opposed us all the time, whether it's in the United Nations or whether it's anything or the nuclear supply group. Uh, nowhere has China supported us. So it's time for us that we give a piece of our mind on various things, whether it, whatever hurts them, whether it's Hong Kong or whether it's you know Tibet or whether it's Taiwan or whether it's the Uyghur Muslims. Okay, great. So, in the current scenario, uh, will a cricket or any other sports series like the 2004 Pakistan cricket series, which you oversaw, help diffuse tension between countries and build positive relations? Did it help in 2004? Well, you know, when I went in 2004, leading that delegation where we had the uh, BCCI people, the media people and others uh, to Pakistan, things were a little different. You know why? Uh, my mandate was very clear to see whether we can have uh, India-Pakistan cricket uh, after 15 years of gap, right? But at that time, Musharraf was there as, as the dictator. So, you know, Pakistan does very well when you when they have a dictator because everyone toes the line. And uh, when I had a meeting uh, with, the, with their home secretary and their team on the other side, and I kept on making ridiculous demands in terms of security, you know, helicopter, helicopter evac and oh, heady evac and all kinds of things. And everything they were saying, yes, yes, yes. And uh, in fact, uh, the Home Secretary, a very, very good man, ex-IPS, uh, I think he was an IPS officer, Kamal Pasha, I think he was 
and he called me to to his room and he said mr azad we we are cooperating with you on everything there's anything else also you let me know so that was very, very nice of him and um, i remember traveling to uh, but to all their you know sensitive areas peshawar we went uh, karachi uh, faizalabad multan um, of course rawalpindi was there and 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 islamabad and these places now everywhere i can say that there was tremendous support of the people uh, for the match and their middle class was just like ours i mean uh, dig duggar of lahore i remember he asked me to address the psp the police services of pakistan they are the equivalent ips officers and they were brilliant people there were some some of them a few of them were doctors some of them were aeronautical engineers and in the civil services so and they were all looking forward to this match Uh, in fact, I remember the hotel I stayed in Lahore. Uh, that tall, seven-footer uh, guard, security guard, asked me. He says, "आपके यहाँ वो green वो चाय मिलती है ना Lipton वाली? वो बहुत अच्छी लगती है. So अगर ये होता तो मैं चाय वहीं से मांगता. You know, the, the, the aspirations. Then somebody was talking about the cassettes he had he had brought from because in '99 I was in charge of the Pakistan security team uh, when they were here. and uh, you know many of this middle class they invited me to their home they have got jeffries they've got that village everything is like here only the same kind of food they had an excellent museum and uh, they were talking about trade they were talking about the cassettes they had bought in chandigarh when when they when the border opened for some matches here so that is all right but the point is today things have soured to that extent that i don't think even a cricket match would uh, you know make any kind of a difference pakistan is in a turmoil look at all the partudis jamuris they are now um, going to oust uh, imran khan they have tried all the families now all the dynasties over so now the army dynasty is left <laughs> so i don't think this is a time when we can really have because they have hurt us too much and hit us too much and uh, i don't think we should go into any kind of matches right now this is not the time So, any particular incidences in your professional life which left an indelible mark and impacted your career? You mentioned one earlier on, but anything other than that you kind of want to talk about? You know, in my, uh, I can't talk about many incidents, but I can certainly say that uh, during the uh, during my service, I've seen the rise and fall of so many of my heroes. Uh, you know, uh, some of the stalwarts I thought. Uh, who would uphold the traditions of the service you know fell in one swoop uh, before the mighty establishment and uh, i was really really disappointed when i heard in a chief minister's meeting you know my seniors buckling down to pressure and of course when i tried to raise my voice i was asked to shut up so but this happens and but i have seen some Uh, some towering personalities and i still remember something somebody like vijay singh a fearless upright officer ias officer son of lp singh uh, the the he was the first home secretary of india who set up the psf and uh, uh, a brilliant man and they used to call him 8 to 8 because he used to sit in his office from 8 o'clock in the morning to 8 o'clock at night and uh, vijay singh taught me a lot uh, he, he's now with the tata sons so i've seen many like him also who held the tradition of service but uh, let me tell you that the impact which i had it was a life shattering experience for me when i didn't make it as the ig chief and i realized that the entire service of mine had gone to waste with this one uh, it was it made such a deep impression on me that i physically and mentally i was broken Uh, for about two to three weeks, but it happens. I, I rose again, and uh, I was uh, the Central Information Commissioner, and I uh, was fine. But it taught me that uh, never should you take success for granted. That was one. And secondly, everything has to be taken in stride. And second, of course, by the time I was hit the second um, <laughs> time, when well, uh, superseded by Central Information Commission, I took it much better. So. Uh, so on and off i would say in good balance it's fine it happens 
So one last question, as in, uh, you know, we have lots of questions and we can go on, but I think I'll, uh, one last question, then we'll open up to, uh, to, the, uh, to our fellow alumni and then we'll ask you some light questions later on about your likes and dislikes. So a question on women. How do you encourage more women in civil services while ensuring their safety, security and support from the government? Should I tell you something? The women are doing wonderfully well in the civil services and they are coming also. They are performing very well. I mean, they are coming up also. Uh, what we need, we need more women at the cutting edge level. You know, uh, we need more women in police stations. We need more women in municipalities to humanize, to sensitize, to work better, to to keep the offices better, you know, the, a sense of efficiency, a sense of cleanliness, a sense of order. This can only be brought about by educated women. And that's why I said, you know, when I meant education, I meant if you educate a woman, you educate a family, mm -hmm. you know, and you educate five people, see the difference. Uh, so uh, in, the, in the defense, for example, Supreme Court has already given the order that they should be even in combat positions, right? Even in, even in other areas, now it is up to the political parties that they should give tickets to at least 33% of the women. If 33% of the women are lawmakers, see the changes in the law and how law will become more and more sensitive to the aspirations of the people, to the common man. And uh, in other places, for example, uh, where women can also perform much better, judiciary, for example, is a very, very critical area where you need more. You need more women in panchayats, in, in the municipalities. And that is uh, how we should go about it, where we have... In fact, I remember when I was in Bhopal, I had two brilliant uh, uh, sub-inspectors, uh, Shehnaz, if I remember, in 95, 96, in Bhopal, who were managing the women uh, cell. And they did a very, very good job. We need more women to humanize, as I said, to make the things more efficient, and to bring a little more order to our systems. All right, so we have a question from Vinay Hebar. His question is, the theory of the case is that use of technology will dramatically reduce corruption in government. Have you seen that play out recently? What's your opinion? Well, the use of technology definitely is of great importance and to a large extent it does bring down corruption and uh, you know other things which people want to for example i'll tell you a very simple thing the police for example uh, the uh, the putting of uh, cctv cameras in police stations uh, by the order of the uh, supreme court has made a lot of difference uh, how you treat people uh, the transactions in a police station all this has, has, has come in full light and you see, um, in the case in Chutikurin, which took place, where, where uh, those two people got killed, uh, was the CCTV was not functioning. So you can see how people are getting scared of it also. The CCTVs which are coming up in, in uh, various places in the city, even the CM Delhi has been trying to put it, has put a curb on a lot of illegal practices. The use of technology certainly is going to uh, is, is, is going to bring down corruption. Okay. So we have a question from Gayatri. Uh, her question is, what are your favorite intelligence bureau-based movies? Do you think they do justice to what you really do? <laughs> okay. You know, there, was a, there is a brilliant movie which I always, what is that? Present and Real Danger. That famous uh, actor was there. Fear uh, and Present Danger. Huh, yes. That's, Harrison Ford. Harrison Ford, yeah, yeah. So that's a brilliant movie and uh, quite real. And otherwise, there are lots and lots of movies. I can't say whether they are uh, very close to reality because let me tell you, um, it's a tough job. And uh, many a times, it's a very, very unglamorous job too. Uh, but uh, the uh, intelligence uh, officers portrayed in some of the movies uh, are correct. You know, there are series of uh, them on Netflix and they are showing you the advance in technology and things like that. And if you, if you cut down on the, uh, uh, what you call paraphernalia, 
then and if you reduce it down to the basics 30 percent then they correspond to the reality i can't say anything uh, nothing beyond this so we have a question from dr milin vag his question is does india deserve being a democracy considering the absolute abuse of the system over decades what's your opinion you know uh, let's keep our hopes alive i mean <laughs> uh there is uh, there is a lot of uh, problem with our democracy there's no doubt i also know that uh, sometimes the free speech uh, has been uh, curbed i also know that juapa or the nsa or the use of tata earlier uh, was not certainly uh, justified on all but you know uh, let me tell you to give that uh, hope is that uh, there are still uh, men and women of pride in the civil services in the army and in various positions who want to uphold the the system who want to uphold democracy and who cherish freedom i mean after all we've got it uh, after much fight from from the britishers so uh, let's say let's keep our hopes alive though i can understand everything is not all right with our democracy so next question is india is slowly being looked at sorry one say india is slowly being looked at as an alternate to china for many reasons manufacturing may take some time but india is emerging as a service center to the world your opinion on that please you see i was uh, watching um, a channel and um, mr md nalpat said a very important thing which i liked and he said this is india's moment india's moment in two respects one is related to your question you're right that in manufacturing will take a little while but you know uh with the wages r- rising in china and uh, all these developments which have which have taken place there is a lot that india can look forward to getting investments uh, from uh, uh, abroad in so many in so many areas Uh, but to do that we have to put our house in order you know men some of the industries have already gone to to say uh, i think vietnam and even bangladesh is uh, yeah because of their labor uh, is like that as far as services sector goes we are very very strong and uh, i have a feeling now that uh, with with india emerging as a strong democracy taking taking all the countries together you know and, and i'm I, i i have always been a votary of that we must look to the east and strengthen our relations with southeast asia whether the philippines whether it's the other countries there you know indonesia etc etc and if we if if we go on this on, on this path uh, then i'm sure that uh, we'll be able to but there are a lot of changes we have to do you know has to be you can't keep slogans of atmanirbhar you know really uh, on top of the line that, that that is not really the way to go you have to keep it a little muted you have to you know after all the export led growth is the real growth and which which has given us 11% uh, you know uh, earlier and if you don't have an export led growth then Uh, we may fall back into that hindu rate of growth earlier which is about 3.5% or something so i would say that it is india's moment and there are uh, there, there are great opportunities and we really need to clinch it great okay. rita day wants to know as common citizens how can we be of help support to the uh, department but i guess government also kind of gets covered under that oh you can be of a uh, great great support you know uh, i would say social media platforms and i have always maintained social media platform should not be used for trivia they should always be used for important issues you know social media should be used for anti pollution measures it should be used for and uh, traffic regulation it should be for uh, you know garbage removal you know b- b- hospital management you know it gives people ideas everyone everyone reads his handle in the twitter they might ignore it but the pressure from the social media if it builds up they have to act and this is where a common man can play a very very important role secondly you know you'll be surprised 
uh, you may think that you are a drop in the ocean and therefore your advice may not be counted. That's not true. If you are giving advice, everyone watches it. You know, number three, the right to information is a very, very powerful tool. You should raise the right questions. You should raise the right issues so that it gets flagged in the certain quarters and the governments know. You know, it is incumbent upon the government not only to give answers, but post many of these issues on their own website so that people know already. People don't need to ask them. Everything should be there. Mechanical sweepers. How many mechanical sweepers have there been in Delhi? How many of these, uh, you know, anti-pollution towers have been, have been constructed? How many of these mobile towers were recently constructed in a particular area? All this is information which needs to be in the public domain. You know, the metros today have to change. The metros are gearing for a population of, you know, one to two crores, whether it's Bombay, Calcutta, or, or, or Delhi. And unless the common man participates, it will be not easy to manage them. And that's why it is incumbent upon you to use the social media and use various platforms, the RTI, et cetera, et cetera, letters, you know, TVs, so that things can become better and more manageable. So Sumit Rajani wants to know what can be done to improve selective or inconsistent implementation and execution of policies laid out by the government law and order situation. I Incons Sorry, uh, you want me to repeat the question? No, I understand. But inconsistent policies towards law and order, I don't know if you mean... Uh, Sometimes it's, it's, it's a very harsh crackdown or sometimes the lazy fare. Uh, well, I suppose the governments act according to the situation. And maybe I, I did not get the tenor of the question, what exactly specific it is. So. Sumit, you want to kind of spell out a little bit more? Sumit? I, well, he's there, but I'm not. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, yeah, so Sumit. I mean, the government has laid out enough and more policies for the common man, uh, you know, to be within a framework of rules. Uh, there's uh, the police force uh, act, rather should act as per, uh, you know, the rules laid out by them. But somehow we don't see consistency in those. We sometimes see cases getting solved overnight. Sometimes they hang on, uh, you know, dragged on for years. Sometimes you just felt that it, justice wasn't done. So what can we do to improve this? And uh, how can we sort of make it more consistent for the for the common man? Okay. Well, I understand that uh, certain cases are um, you know investigated for long, and nothing comes out of it. I mean, I I, I can see that Sushant Singh Rajput is one of the cases uh, where the man deserved a dignified closure, but is going on and on for a very long time. Uh, it got mired in political controversy. And that is why, otherwise, it is it is not a rocket science and it should have been closed by now because the indications are very, very clear with respect to uh, the murder or suicide angle or with respect to even uh, abetment of suicide. Now, you know, by and large, I'll give you, Sumit, uh, a very simple rule. What happens is in India, and unfortunately is, that if you see a particular case and it has no political ramifications or anything, the case gets solved as per merits, and therefore 85% of the cases are solved in the right manner. There are 15% of the cases, I agree with you, uh, you, you don't find a reason. Why is it being delayed or why does it mean, you know, put under short strift? And that is because of, uh, uh, you know, there is a political yay or there are some vested interests. And that is why most important, as you said, what should be done is selection of good police leadership or bureaucratic leadership is very, very important. Once you choose people well, you know, you don't have these problems. At least the problems are going to be minimized. And I think that is the only way out. And one of the issues which the Supreme Court said in police reforms was to the various state governments, that there should be a fixity of tenure for the directors general of police, that is the head of the police forces, and that they should be selected also in a particular manner. If we follow this, which even the Supreme Court has directed to the state government, then I'm sure to a large extent, this problem is going to be solved. 
so we have the next question from sunit salvi his question is what is the difference in governance and administration services pre and post 2014 <laughs> well, well let me tell you the the system has remained the same uh the bureaucracy and the police um, has the same ethos uh, and has the same guidelines it's it's it works under the same uh, rules and conditions uh, but yet uh, there are two aspects of it one is the various state services uh, what is happening in the various states and one what is happening in in in, in center in center with the change in party of course different prime ministers have different way of functioning different uh, um, uh, you know governments have a different style of functioning uh, it may be a more personal style there might be more personal signature to it some people say that is more a presidential uh, you know a, a kind of working you know there is there is little cabinet participation but some people also say that the decisions are quicker faster and on many things you have a clear policy which is there unlike earlier which used to be very very diffuse as far as the, uh, the 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 bureaucrats and the policemen are concerned they are supposed to advise correctly they are supposed to give uh, uh, give uh, fearless frank advice whether that is being done or not one doesn't know because it, it is hidden in their note sheets what they are advising the uh, the people there so uh, people have different views about how things have changed in 2014 as far as the bureaucracy goes or the police goes i don't think much has changed because they are behaving the same way as they were behaving earlier you know sometimes supine sometimes you know fearless sometimes you know hiding uh, below the sea level so you know some some remain in services for survival some remain true to their conscience and some just go with the flow and that remains the same. So Raja Shekhar Reddy wants to know what are your thoughts on lateral entry in civil services? I think it's an excellent idea. In fact, I think the civil services should be reformed. I think also that a real hard look should be taken at the uh, uh, at the induction. I also think that 70%, 80% of the people who are inducted in a particular batch are not fit to lead later. So there should be a weeding out every 10 years 20 years and 30 years and the last 10 years should all only be for those 2% of the people who can command who can lead who are fearless who are upright unfortunately that is not the case because you know in in the long ride home the, the guy who trundles and is quietly at a corner not you know affecting anybody's lives is the one who makes it in the end and that's a very very unfortunate thing i also think that the present rate of induction is extremely low getting 10 or 15 joint secretaries here and there will not make any difference to the government of india i think there should be at least 50% in lateral uh, entry uh, induction there should be brilliant lawyers brilliant aim uh, uh, ex alumni brilliant uh, other iitians they are the ones who should now you know flood the services at the at the higher levels and that is how we are going to make a difference in the police we need lateral entry in wireless we need you know lateral entry in prosecution we need lateral entry in so many areas in computers cyber so uh, this is a new look but the you know the problem in india is nobody has time to look into it and the entire labyrinth it moves slowly like a ajgar what is ajgar in english python and you know it just doesn't move and that is a problem lateral entry is a must and it should be in larger and larger numbers so the next question is from romi agarwal your views in the role of police and police chief in the ongoing tussle with republic tv <laughs> see there are two sides uh, to it one is i don't think the uh, police should get into these trp ratings I, I, this is not the business of the police so, so you're wasting time there are too many important things to look into you know crime law and order you know 
so traffic, so many other things in Mumbai. It's a huge place. It's suffering pandemic. People are people are you know suffering from anxiety, depression. They need the police to help out in so many cases. So that is uh, that, that that is one. Uh, I don't think there should be a personal war. I don't think also that the police was attacking the republic in, in that manner. I suppose the handling of the, uh, or the questioning could have been a little more humane. It, it, it needs to be more sensitive. No matter how the RP, um, I, the, the Mumbai police feels that it has been um, shabbily treated by the republic. So I think uh, there should be a counter to it. And as I told you earlier, a little bit of self-regulation, a little bit of self-restraint. In fact, Arnab had called me on um, the channel also. He's from my college. So uh, I, I was very hesitant. So once or twice I went there, but he treated me well. So I escaped unhurt. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to take the last question and uh, from Darshan and then hand it over to Nikhil. Uh... So his question is, do you believe corporate type salary for government employees and elected representatives like in Singapore will reduce corruption and improve governance? No, it won't. You know, uh, uh, when we entered the services, um, of course, one of the reasons also was there was hardly anything else. As I told you, the bright guys went into medical and uh, uh, engineering. So the guys who were left like me, what, what could we do? We had nothing to go to, uh, you know, a uh, few corporate houses. And so we used to appear for UPSC. It was a national pastime. And those who got selected by chance, uh, they had made it. But, you know, when you join the services, it's, you know, you're imbued with a sense of ideology. I said, people might laugh at it now, but it was, uh, you know, to serve the nation was a you know, matter of great pride, you know, a great pride. It was not the money and you know if you really look at it you get enough you get enough i mean you the, the government the government of india really looks after you you i, I remember i was living in palatial bungalows and uh, i was embarrassed because you know it was so huge you get all the facilities there is no question of indulging in corruption i mean if if you do I don't know why it has to be an unsatiable greed for for or lust for money and uh, so i don't think uh, salaries uh, have anything to do with it's a question of attitude and you'll be shocked to know that some of the people who have already had a lot of money are making more money <laughs> so whether it's in the corporate stream or whether it's here there is a different first of all i think that uh, uh, the the punishment should be quick very swift, very swift. In India, you see all these uh, cases, they mostly fail. It's very difficult to prove because there is so much of exactness required in the evidence. You know, secondly, there should be this also very quick dismissals, which again, of course, something has been uh, said that after 30 years of service, you can't dismiss under the new rule. Uh, but I don't think uh, increase in salaries brings about any reduction in corruption. Some of them undeservedly get even that salary which they are getting. Nikhil, over to you, please. <laughs> the questions are flowing in, Asho. Uh, and uh, our Mr. Ghate, uh, as usual, uh, controversy is shy. Uh, he has asked a question uh, saying that how can we make bureaucracy independent of politics and politicians? Point in question if an IPS officer arrests a man who goes on to become a minister, should he salute him? And there's another question from Mr. Ajay Singh Randhava from uh, Delhi. He's, he says that why has the bureaucracy largely lost their tool? And is it because there will be sidelined, the fear of being sidelining or post-retirement appointments? So this is... These are, uh, these are very um, hard and very pointed questions. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, you know, the autonomy of the uh, bureaucracy and the police has been uh, uh, discussed for long. And uh, if you look at the act under which uh, the All India Services were created, the cadre was created only uh, because uh, it was thought that the steel frame of the bureaucracy uh, will, will ward off any political pressures and will be able to advise fearlessly 
uh, and correctly, even in times of adversity and great pressure. Uh, unfortunately, uh, and this relates to the second uh, question, that unfortunately, due to this uh, sword hanging over the head of frequent transfers, you know, some honest officers are shunted around so much that it virtually ruins their lives. You know, even if, uh, uh, you know, for example, I was in Madhya Pradesh, it won't matter to me because I don't belong to that place. I don't have any relatives. I don't have any, you know, land property holding there when I went there. So I don't mind being transferred. But everyone's case is not like that. And when the family suffers, then the, then, then the officers do buckle in. Now, that is a serious issue. I don't know how it can be solved. There are still 30% of the officers who stand up to it and, and get themselves transferred. Because, you know, as I said, in five years of your ten tenure in the, in the state, people know your reputation. It's known all over the state. And if you're an SP or collector of a district, every Panwala knows, uh, you know, what kind of a man you are. Because they see you every day and they know about you every day. Now, in, in autonomy, as far as the police reform is concerned, the Supreme Court has already given directions. The state government are not obeying it. In bureaucracy, there is this, uh, um, you know, insulation which is there. But then you are again subject to the whims and fancies of your uh, of the state uh, political executive. So all in all, in this kind of democracy, we will continue to face the wrath uh, of 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 an angry uh, political uh, executive. And it is up to you to stand up or the way you manage. So you hope for the best that good, fearless, upright bureaucrats and policemen are there who take the fall, but do not, do not, you know, the abandon their principles. No, now you have spoken about the world, about your service. And uh, Asavri had prepared these questions. I think we should ask these questions. This is uh, current Johar type. Okay, rapid fire. Your favorite author or favorite book? Oh, you know, you'll be surprised. Uh, that is uh, Acharya Chatrusen, Vaishali Ki Nagar Vadhu. In fact, when I was young, my dad gave me this book. And, uh, you know, uh, it's a very fascinating tale. And he told me a story about the city states. And that is how uh, the daughters were named in our house. My elder brother's daughter is called uh, Vaishali. Hmm. You know, Vaishali ki Nagarvatu. My daughter is Mithila. And if the next daughter would have come, she would have been named Vidisha. I, I still remember, it's one of the most fascinating books I've ever read. Of course, now the latest I read was by that famous Israeli Noah Harari. That, that book on, I, uh, hmm. But that book has left a deep imprint on my mind and also the uh, the English version of Mahabharat by Raja Gopalachari. So the 17 days battle, which I know by heart. <laughs> but I love history. And I love also William Darlington, the way he describes the British rule. I just finished one. His favorite sport? Anarchy. Well, you know, cricket. <laughs> <laughs> uh, favorite food? Indian. Uh, favorite movie or TV series? Favorite movie or TV series? See, see, you could speak about Galwan. You could speak about Pakistan. <laughs> so I thought, kuch to yasho bhaiya ko thoda to corner karna padega. So I said, let's ask. I mean, as I had prepared this, so I said, kahi to kahi, you know. Maybe <laughs> <laughs> you know one bandish bandit so super. Netflix. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so uh, because that is top of the mind, that's why you don't want to <laughs> go behind. <huh? laughs> okay. Uh, favorite holiday destination? Favorite holiday destination is Goa. Uh, favorite music genre or song? Oh my God. Mohabbat Mere Mehboob Namang, Noor Jahan. Agge and, and um, uh, the writer, of course, uh, Fez. I and, love uh, girls. I love girls. And favorite moment at AIM because we are meeting today because of AIM. So favorite moment at AIM. Diwali gathering which I uh, organized over there and in which all the uh, 
professors had come and uh, the families, Indian families had come. That was a great moment. Celebrating. Uh, for me there. Will I, I mean, uh, will I be talking to a future member of parliament, Yashovardhan Asa? <laughs> I'm speechless. <laughs> <laughs> No, because because कैसे है आपके छोटे भाई साहब खेले अभी वो थोड़े टाइम के लिए पवेलियन में आ गए अभी आपकी बारी I don't know I think I'll be too old by the next parliament but let's see ambassador Nikhil ambassador so thank you Mr Yashovardhan Asa for a lovely lovely webinar and this has uh, really flourish because Asavari's questions and your answers. Uh, I mean, it is really fantastic. And uh, many people would like to talk to you after this. So I'll stop the recording and I'll unmute all because getting you on an AIM platform is, is very a rarity. So I'll stop the recording now. Okay.